Sampling Principles Introduction to Sampling Sampling is the process of selecting a part of something with the intent of showing the quality, style, and nature of the whole. We sample because we want to learn about a population or an area of interest. We also sample because it's often very difficult to accurately census or to ensure that we've measured all individuals in a population. We sample because we want to make inferences about the population, meaning that we want to be able to draw conclusions about the population, and we are in using the sample to inform those inferences. We also want to generalize or make statements about the population with a certain degree of confidence. The population is a complete set of individuals or the entire area that we want to describe or make inferences about. Now, here we're talking about a statistical population, which is different from a biological population. And in the statistical sense, the set of variables is inclusive of all variables in the sampling universe, which is the population that we can sample from. So it consists of all sampling units. The sample, on the other hand, is simply the subset, a subset of the population. And so it is a subset of the sampling units. And it's important to be aware that there are an infinite number of samples that you can take from a population. Our choice of sampling units is dependent on a number of factors. First, our, what are the objectives for sampling? What do we want to know? And why do we want to know it? The choice of sampling units is also dependent on vegetation characteristics, not just the characteristics of individual plants, such as height, density, species identification, etc but also characteristics of the vegetation as a whole, whether you're dealing with different vegetation type, such as a forest or a grassland or a shrubland, or the density, the sparseness of all plants, etc., goes into our choice of sampling units. There are a variety of different types of sampling units, and this includes points, transects, or lines, quadrats or plots, and individuals. In the case of individuals, you can choose either to use a whole plant as an individual, or if you're interested in just different parts of plants, such as tillers or stems, inflorescences, individual flowers, or fruits, you can identify those as being the sampling unit. Now a variable is a characteristic that w whose value can vary from one entity to another. Variables can be measured or estimated and they can be quantitative or qualitative. Data collection is the process of gathering information about variables of interest. And we need to use care when we're selecting the variables that are going to be measured. As Krebs said, not everything that can be measured should be. In the context of sampling vegetation, the most commonly measured variables are attributes of the vegetation, such as density, frequency, cover, biomass, etc. When we're describing populations, we use population parameters. 
These are descriptive measures that characterize a population. They are assumed to be fixed, so not changing, but they're also unknown. And the reason it, that they are unknown goes back to this idea that we cannot be sure that we can accurately census all individuals in a population. We assume that population parameters change in value only when the population itself changes. So if a population is increasing or decreasing, that would be reflected when we measure or estimate a population parameter to change. Population parameters are denoted with Greek letters. Sample statistics are, they mirror population parameters. They are descriptive measures that characterize a sample. They are used to estimate population parameters. Now, sample statistics can vary from sample to sample. Remember, there's an infinite number of samples that we can choose out of populations. And they also can change or vary if the population itself changes. Sample statistics are denoted with Roman letters. When we're describing populations and samples, we tend to use two main types of parameters and statistics. And these are focus on central tendency and variability. With central tendency, we're interested in knowing what is the most common value. And this is often measured using three different types of measures uh, or formats of measure of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. For variability, we're interested in describing how much the values vary. And the most common ways of reporting variability are standard deviation, standard error, variance, and coefficient of variation. Now the differences between these different forms of measures will be described in a little bit. So let's take a look at an example in order to underst uh, better understand these, the differences in central tendency and variability. And here in the picture below, we have uh, 61 individuals, 161 individuals, who are members of a marching band. The women are dressed in white and the men are wearing blue. They're arranged uh, by height, so they're actually ordered as a histogram or a bar chart would show. All of the individuals are lined up here by height, and they, which varies from five foot zero all the way up to six foot five. So let's take a look at central tendency first. We see that, first of all, they have different uh, sample sizes, obviously. There's uh, N equals 79, so there's 79 women. There's 82 men and a total of 161 in the group. If we look at the mean value, which is simply the average value of all of the observations, we can see that the different groups have different means. The women have the, a shorter average value, 64.8 inches. The men are taller on average, 70.1. And the group mean is intermediate between the two. The median value is the, the, the value of the central observation if you were to take all of the observations and rank them by value and then choose the one that falls in the very center. That is the median value. And so we can see again that the women have a shorter or smaller median value 
than the men and that the um, group median is intermediate between the two. Now the median value is something that is often considered when there are extreme outliers. So if you have some values that are extremely low or some values that are extremely high, those values would tend to pull the mean in one direction or another. And so we say that the median is robust to outliers because it's not influenced by these low or high values. The last measure is the mode. And the mode is simply the observed value that occurs most frequently. So we can see here that for the entire group, the longest line are those individuals that are five foot six. This also happens to be the longest line of women. And so the group and the women have the same mode. 70 inches or five foot 10 is the, is the line that has the most number of, the most men have that recorded obser observed value. Now the mean is the value or the form of central tendency that we use most often when we are reporting the results of our sampling. If we look at vari variability, we can see that the standard deviation, which simply reports the amount of spread between the values, um, varies with the different groups. The spread of the values or the standard deviation for the women and for the men is far smaller than that for the entire group. And you can see that simply by looking at the people in this image. The standard error is another commonly used measure of variability. Standard error is calculated by taking the standard deviation and dividing that by the square root of n, or the sample size. It's interesting that in this case, the standard error is the same for all three groups. And that's because not only the standard deviations are different, but the sample size for each one of these groups is different as well. And so when you take 3.9 inches and divide that by the square root of 161, you get the same average or the same standard deviation that you do when you take 2.7 and divide that by the square root of 79. We will talk about the difference between reporting the standard error and the standard deviation in a subsequent lesson. Variance is something that is not used commonly when we're reporting results of sampling, primarily because the units for variance are different than the units that we measure. The variance is defined as the standard deviation squared and so instead of being reported in inches, it's reported in square inches. So variance isn't used very often for reporting uh, parameters and statistics. Now the coefficient of variation is an, an estimate of variability that is most commonly used when we are looking at groups that have very different means in terms of the magnitude of their means. The coefficient of variation is, ca is reported as a percentage, and it is the standard deviation divided by the mean. So the amount of spread in the data is weighted or relativized by the size of the mean. In this example here, we can see that there's less variability in the um, height of the women compared to the height of the men, and that both of these are less than the uh, height of the group in terms of the variability. 
However, these differences aren't all that big, and it's important to note that coefficient of variation is most often used when we're comparing populations uh, or samples from different populations that have extreme differences in the magnitude of the mean. So let's talk about accuracy and precision. Accuracy is the closeness of a measured value to the population's true value, whereas precision is the closeness of repeated measured values to each other. It's convenient to envision this by looking at a target and assuming that the central value, or the bullseye in the target, symbolizes the true mean value of the population. And in this case, each one of these x symbols represents a different observed or measured value. In this first case here, we see that the observed values are close to each other in value, so they are precise, but they are also, if you were to take the mean of each one of these individual measurements, it would fall very close to the bullseye. So in this example, we have both accurate, meaning that it's close to the, the measured value, is close to its true value, and precise. In another example, we see with multiple observations that their mean would, the mean of these observations would fall close to the center, and so it would be accurate, but the different observed values are not very close to each other, and so they are not precise. In this third example, we see that the observed values are very close to each other in value, and so they are precise, but they're not accurate. And in the fourth example, we see these observed values are neither precise nor accurate. And it's important to be aware that in this case, we're talking about statistical precision reflecting the closeness of measured values. And this is very different from measurement precision, in which case you're concerned with how precisely you make a measurement, whether you measure something, if you're weighing something, whether you measure it to the nearest kilogram or gram or hundredth of a gram. That is measurement precision, and that will be described and discussed in a subsequent lesson. Now, bullseyes are terrific models for learning, but we're often not estimating values that are using real targets. So let's look at a different example. In this case, we're interested in estimating the weight of an individual pig. And uh, this is being done at a county fair, and we have three groups of observers, different families, that are going to estimate weights. Each one of these families has three observers, and we can see that in each family group they come up with their own w estimates of how much this little pig weighs. So let's take a look and see which of these groups are, uh, compare them in terms of whether they are accurate and precise in their estimates. Family group one has a very precise estimate. They're all very close to each other with a standard deviation of only about five and with a mean of 25. Family group two has a little more spread in their values with a larger standard deviation of 20, and we can see that demonstrated here. And family group three is even less precise with a standard deviation of 30, so you can see much larger spread there. Now, normally, we don't know what the true value of the actual mean would be, but in this case, we're actually just estimating the, the weight of a, an individual pig, and this little guy weighs 25 pounds. 
So in this case, we know that family groups 1 and 2 are equally accurate in their estimate because their mean estimate is 25 pounds. But there's definitely more, uh, family group 1 is more precise. Family group 3, we can see, is neither accurate nor precise. So in gathering, in data gathering activities, we strive for both accuracy and precision. Remember that the population parameters are unknown, but fixed. And we use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. The difference between the sample statistic and the true population parameter is called error. There are two main types of error. Sampling error, which is also called random error, arises strictly due to chance. This is due to measuring a subset of the population, which individuals go into your sample, and so it's simply due to chance. The, this kind of error tends to cancel out as the sample size increases. And we can estimate and report the amount of sampling error. It can be estimated statistically. Sampling error or random error affects the precision of our estimate. Non-sampling error, also called systematic error, is related to faulty equipment, poor technique, or human errors. Non-sampling error introduces bias, which means the consistent over or under estimation of values. It is not detectable statistically, and non-sampling error affects the accuracy of our estimate. So let's take a little closer look at examples of sampling error. In this case, we're looking at three schematic diagrams of the same population. Individuals in the population are represented by the little dots. The true population size is 400 plants. And these different um, samples are, the differences between the samples are simply due to the location of the, of the quadrats. Now the true mean density of this population is four plants in the size of a quadrat. And in each one of these samples, the density was estimated using 10 quadrats, but they were located randomly, and so that's the major difference here. We can see that simply by the difference in location of the quadrats, uh, the, the estimate of both the mean and the standard deviation is quite different. In sample one, the mean is relatively close to the true population mean, and so is the standard deviation. So the population size estimate of 500, while still larger than the true population size of 400, is not too bad for a sample. In sample two, just by chance, the quadrats tended to land in areas that had no plants or very few plants, and so we get a very low estimate for population size. Um, in the different extreme, in sample three, the location of the quadrats happened to fall where there were many plants, and we see that we get an overestimate of the population size. And these differences are due to sampling error or just the chance location of those quadrats. Now, non-sampling error has a number of different potential sources, and this includes non-random location of sampling units, 
So purposely location, locating your sampling units in an area, improper training of your observers, inconsistent technique among your observers, misidentification of species, using faulty equipment, poor data recording, data entry errors, so human error, and lastly, subjective estimates, uh, or purposely influencing the value in an observation. All of these sources are uh, examples of non-sampling error and they can introduce bias or the consistent over or under estimation into our estimates. Remember, with non-sampling error, it is not detectable statistically. So there are a number of things that we can do to reduce non-sampling error. We can uh, take certain actions such as calibrating equipment, clearly defining protocol, carefully training observers, and randomizing to avoid subjectivity. We assume that in the absence of bias, precision will lead to accuracy. So to review, we sample in order to better describe populations. Sample statistics are used to estimate population parameters. And these statistics and parameters that are most commonly reported reflect central tendency and dispersion or variability. In our sampling, we strive for accuracy and precision. Sampling error is due to chance and affects precision, whereas non-sampling error introduces bias and affects accuracy. In the absence of bias, precision leads to accuracy.